heard from Mike McCann, the uh, weather is anything but cheerful looking unless you like snow and uh, the possibility of ice accompanying it. Later today, the afternoon, evening hours, and Monday should be real buttes, especially for anybody who is traveling any distance. Uh, Some of the outlying areas in our listening area could really get walloped in terms of the accumulation. And appropriate for the discussion that we are going to have, we're going to get into uh, this idea of trying to protect yourself when maybe you're out shoveling with some of that snow. But we'll also talk a little bit about this idea of injuries with winter sports. And any times that we have uh, had discussions on this program with um, talk about injuries, usually our listeners have gotten involved. Um, Hopefully later in this hour, we can do some of that as well. Joining us on our program is the founder of Ortho Balance Physical Therapy, which is located in Great Neck uh, on Long Island. Uh, Dr. Attilio, I hope the last name is pronunciation of this is correct. You and I have not spoken uh, directly, uh, doctor. Is your last name, is it pronounced Pensaval? Uh, there's an E at the end of it. Good morning, Bob. How are you? And good morning. What's the correct pronunciation? It's Pensavali. Pensavali. It a little while in the beginning, too. Okay. Pensavali. I hope you've been well. I am just fine. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, in beginning this discussion, um, you know, I mentioned this idea of what's coming up or what we think is coming up in terms of this snowstorm, anybody who's tried to go to a grocery store in uh, recent days knows that people are, to say the least, getting prepared. When it comes to this idea of going out and trying to attack sometimes very large amounts of snow, what should we keep in mind? Well, you know, it's a, it's a great question. Certainly it is timely, and there are a lot of things to keep in mind. Um, you know, certainly going out, clearing snow, shoveling snow is not going to be the highlight of most people's days. <laughs> so, yeah, so there, there really are a few things uh, to, to keep in mind. If you take it from the beginning, first of all, you need to dress appropriately. Um, you know, clearing snow is a uh, uh, somewhat of a vigorous um, physical task, uh, you need to dress appropriately. You need to wear, wear warm clothing, certainly good good shoes that are going to keep you warm and give you good traction, uh, and, and gloves. Uh, the next thing is to look at your, your task and really plan ahead. Uh, the two major problems that people run into, uh, you know, serious problems when they, when they shovel snow is uh, overexertion. Um, and it's bad for anybody who has any level of, of, of heart problem, whether they know about it or whether it's um, un, un, undiagnosed that yet, or back pain. So you need to uh, dress, dress appropriately, and you need to plan out your, uh, your task. Uh, and that includes knowing the, the snow that you want to remove first and where you want to put that snow so that this way you don't double shovel, uh, so to speak. You know, you shovel, put the snow from one area to another, and then reposition that, that already repositioned snow. Make triple, double and triple work for yourself. Uh, body mechanics are very important. Uh, bending your knees are very important. There are a lot of different factors, and we can get into all of those little by little. Well, this idea of getting prepared, I mean, do, do you suggest people actually warm up before they start? Well, yeah, actually, um, you know, it is a physical task. There is bending involved, and uh, you, you bring that up. This is a perfect uh, venue to talk about this. I, I really do recommend, you know, it's, if, you, if you were going out on a soccer field, if you were going out to play baseball, um, any uh, pro athlete, any uh, scholastic athlete is going to stretch their muscles. They're going to warm up appropriately before they engage in the task at hand. And, you know, snow shoveling is, is really no different because it is a very high-stress activity. And the idea of the approach that one takes to this, you know, the the, the last um, snowstorm of significance, if I can phrase it that way, was one that had several different elements to it. And I guess we may be looking at that again, depending on exactly where we are in the listening area with the, this latest storm that's coming. Yeah. Is the approach or is the suggestion to maybe approach it from the standpoint of not just waiting until, you know, everything has piled up, but to kind of stage how you approach it? 
That's a that's a perfect uh, thought. Yeah, you know, it's it's easier to shovel a little bit of snow frequently than shovel a lot of snow all at once. It's like anything, you know, make make your work as light as possible, especially with snow, especially with the type of snow that we're expecting. We're expecting wet heavy snow. So if if you wait until the whole the whole deal is over and you go out and try and move a big huge heavy slushy shovel of snow from one spot to the other it's going to be a, a torture so yes you are 100 percent right um i would rather even myself take several you know snow removal episodes during a snowstorm and remove two or three inches at a time rather than remove the whole a whole 12 inch uh, section push versus shovel now there's all kinds of devices um you know, i've got a big uh, snow scoop, um, as well as the regular old school snow shovel, which is the better approach? Well, you know, you're asking the right questions. I, I'll tell you, uh, the better approach, in, you know, when possible, is to push snow because it's much easier on your back. You probably get a lot more um, square footage area done in a shorter period of time, and it's it's less stressful overall. So I would, given given the opportunity, given the situation, always push rather than um, you know shovel and lift and, and throw. It's a much easier, much safer way to remove snow. Earlier in this discussion, you talked about the idea of making sure your feet and your hands are properly uh, covered. Let's talk about the feet. Um, what kind of an approach should be taken there? Well, certainly wear good warm socks. Wear waterproof uh, footwear because uh, the heat in the body is lost in three major areas, your feet, your hands, and your head. And certainly dry footwear. You, know, you follow the rules that they would follow in the military. Keep your feet dry because once they start to get wet, it's, uh, it's very difficult to really keep up with that. And then you, your whole body starts to get cold. So certainly good warm socks. A good footwear that's waterproof gives good traction and gives you good support in the snow. And does the time of day matter when you're approaching the snow? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a good question as well. Some people in my field uh, say that you should uh, shovel a little bit later in the day, and the reason for that is uh, certainly since low back injuries are are prominent in snow shoveling, uh, we often think that since the, the intervertebral disc, and that's a little, little, little disc in your spine, people call it a slip disc or herniated disc, but that's uh, frequently the culprit. It, that's, it's more filled in the morning, and so it is more subject to responding to the pressure that you put on the back. So, yeah, people think that, that snow, snow shoveling later on in the day is better. You also, I believe, used the word uh, posture earlier in this discussion. Um, what is the really the proper posture that we should take? Okay. The proper posture for snow shoveling is very similar to the proper posture that one should have when lifting or bending over any other item, and that is to keep your knees a little bit bent, Try and stabilize your back. There are ways in which people can stabilize their back. One of the obvious ways is to wear a back brace. But in the absence of a back brace, your musculature should be able to tighten your back so that it is nice and firm and ready to support the weight that's going to be on it. So if you're picking up a, a case of soda, you want to uh, bend your knees a little bit, support your back, and lift with your arms and bring the item to your trunk. It's very similar when, you, when you're snow shoveling. You want to bend your knees, you want to brace your back a little bit, and you want to use your arms rather than lifting the snow and the shovel with your back. Don't use your back as a fulcrum. Use your arms more than, more than your back. You want to brace your back, bend your knees, and use your arms. And what about the idea of breaks? In other words, taking some time out. Again, it's a high-risk, you know, high-vigor activity, and the same idea of shoveling smaller amounts of snow frequently. The same thing is here. Don't shovel the whole the whole uh, Megillah all at once. Take a little break, especially if we have heavy snowstorms where, you know, sometimes the whole family is out, you know, shoveling out the whole house, the driveway, the sidewalk, and sometimes around the patio. So yeah, take a break. Absolutely. When you feel pain, now. Uh... This, it would seem, would be an obvious um, thought here, but a lot of people probably may not apply common sense. You you feel pain, what should you do? Okay. 
uh, let's look at what is pain. Well, pain, you know, many, many of us uh, refer to pain as the body's signal, you know, that it's time to slow down and that something may be happening. Yes, it's the body's signal that something may be happening, and a little pain could be the precursor to a uh, a serious injury happening. It could be just a matter of fatigue, but pain needs to be respected, absolutely. So if you're starting to feel pain, that's a sign that, that, that something may be brewing if not, if not already happened, and so you should respect it and, and back off. Maybe it's time to get a relief, um, a relief snow shoveler in there, some, uh, someone else to help out, or at least take a break, that's for sure. And how important is hydration? Very, very important. It's always important in any physical activity. You, you, you don't realize how much, how much uh, moisture you lose from your body, even if you're not sweating and perspiring. You lose a lot of water vapor just breathing in and out, especially in, in cold weather. You, you don't realize it as much, but uh, that, that water vapor coming out of your mouth really dehydrates you. So you really need to um, keep yourself hydrated. And we like to think of the idea of prehydration rather than rehydration. It's much, much easier to, to maintain a proper level of hydration beforehand rather than catching up. Well, how do you do that? Well, take a good drink of water beforehand. You know, a good glass or two of water, uh, that'll, kept, that'll keep you from, from uh, you know, underhydrating yourself and dehydrating. And if you wind up being sore, um, is there anything that you should do that perhaps involves water? Uh, sure. Well, you know, soreness, uh, everybody gets uh, some degree of muscle soreness mm-hmm. after physical activities, you know, whether it's a sport activity or the snow shoveling t- activity. We call it D-O-M-S, delayed onset muscle soreness. And that comes from the lactic acid that's produced in the muscles. That's just a normal process in the metabolism. So when you're doing a lot of work, the body it has a little bit takes a little bit longer time to get rid of that lactic acid, and it's a little bit a little bit irritating to the muscles. So it's very very natural. Um, rehydration, uh, plenty of water, plenty of hydration helps to to smooth that out, and uh, a little bit of low grade activity helps to to pump out some of that lactic acid as well. So that's a very common thing. Uh, you shouldn't be disappointed if you don't get it, but uh, it's very very normal. We're talking on our program on The Fan, Sports Radio 1019 and Sports Radio 66. I'm Bob Salter. We're joined by Dr. Attilio Pensavalli. He is the founder of OrthoBalance Physical Therapy, which is located in Great Neck. When we get into talking about the uh, winter sports and the types of injuries associated with those sports, what are some of the things that are most common, doctor? Well, you know, sports injuries are uh, common throughout sports, but and in particular winter sports because we have snow, there's ice, there are very high speeds involved in all of these things, and again, high stress activities. We have a number of different uh, injuries. Certainly, knee injuries are uh, top of the list. Uh, knee injuries are, are top of the list throughout, but certainly uh, winter sports are no exception. Knee injuries are by far. And when you talk about knee injuries, what kinds of things with the knee? Okay. There's a, there are a whole host of things. You know, the knee is an amazing joint. It's, uh, you know, a round bone on top of a relatively flat bone, and it's called upon to do a whole lot of different activities, bend, uh, push, twist. So there are a number of things. You have four main ligaments in the knee, two on the, out, two on the outer side and two within the center. Those are called the cruciate ligaments. And the main one is called the anterior cruciate ligament or the one that we refer to as the ACL. Those are the initials. And that's very, very commonly injured. It's a significant injury because it's one of the main supporters of the knee. So ACL injury or anterior cruciate injury is a uh, 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 one that's top on the list. Also, the meniscus, which is something that people typically refer to as a torn cartilage. Uh, those menisci are uh, in the knee. There are two of them, one on each side, and they're like little doorstops. They're little uh, stabilizers within the knee. They get caught because of twisting and the pressure of torsion that, that's caused by a lot of different physical activities, and they sometimes get torn, cause a lot of irritation. So, ACL injuries and torn meniscus are the two top ones. Okay. Now, with winter sports and the types of injuries that one sees with people who are participating in them, I mean, this is something that basically is on the rise in terms of injuries, or are people being taking better precautions, being better prepared? 
Perfect question. Yeah, uh, it's they're not on the rise, actually. Uh, the general injury rate is uh, gradually decreasing. What we seem to see is, however, that the the rate of more serious injuries is somewhat increasing. And that, I think, is directly related to the fact that uh, skiing and snowboarding and all of the different uh, sports tend to have more and more complex and, you know, consequently high-risk tricks and moves involved. So generally, uh, safety equipment, safety understanding, and better technique are reducing the overall injury rate, but uh, many of the more serious injuries are increasing simply because of greater risk being taken with different moves. When you talk about injuries with skiing, snowboarding, for example, who, who typically is injured? Okay. Uh, novices, people who are beginners at the sport, uh, the sports, because these are uh, very stressful, high-risk sports activities. Uh, those who take unnecessary risks, so in other words, those who may not be novices, but they overextend themselves, where they should be on a medium-level uh, ski slope, they maybe go into an expert ski slope. Uh, uh, ski slope. Sorry, I had a little tongue twister there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they may get, you know, just put put themselves uh, in in a in a difficult position. So novices and people who underestimate or actually overestimate their skill level. And when you're talking about people who've taken steps like that, I mean, that's, that seems to be obvious what they could do to avoid that. But yeah. in terms of really getting prepared for taking on any of these kinds of activities, what do you recommend? Well, you know, it relates to the first question you asked me earlier on the show. Um, how do you prepare for uh, going out and doing snow removal? Mm-hmm. And first, first of all is, is dress properly. And uh, in... In winter sports, it's not only to dress properly, but it's to have proper, well-fitted, um, safe equipment. It's a very, very equipment-dependent type of activity. Um, skis need to have proper release bindings. Uh, you need to, have to dress warm if you're going to be up on uh, ski slopes for any amount of time. Certainly, you're doing an activity that will increase your body temperature and keep you warm within. But there's a lot of, um, a lot of dead time in terms of uh, getting back up into, uh, you know, into the top of a slope. So certainly dressing properly and using proper equipment. And one of the things I can't stress um, too highly is the use of a helmet. Uh, so many times we see concussions, head injuries that become very, very significant. You know, the name of my office is Ortho Balance PT, and um, many balance disorders are um, directly as a direct result of uh, concussion. So certainly use a helmet. And when you talk about that idea of the importance of using a helmet, is that for people of all age groups? Yes, especially children especially younger adults, uh, younger folks, but, yeah, all ages because uh, these are high-risk, high-velocity activities, skiing, snowboarding, certainly. You know, Jackie Hernandez is a, a snowboarder from the United States. She was doing snow, snowboard, uh, snow cross, and she was injured. She had suffered a, a, a concussion, you know, significant concussion. She was taken off the, uh, off the, uh, the snow slopes uh, on a stretcher. Uh, so even if you are a pro, even if you are an elite athlete, and even if you are wearing a helmet, the risks are still there. If somebody wants to build strength, what sort of things can you recommend in terms of exercises? Okay. Let's look at where you need your strength. Uh, With uh, all um, winter activities, your lower body strength is is paramount. Your legs, your calf muscles, your big thigh muscles, those are very, very important. So let's work on that. Uh, Your quadriceps and your hamstrings, certainly walking, stair climbing is very, very good. Um, If you're at the gym, you can uh, do some leg press, uh, and that's uh, usually a machine where you lie on your back and you're basically pushing a big plate with with your legs. It's it's replicating a a movement that is going from a seated, seated position to a standing position, and that works your big muscles in your your lower body. 
uh, trunk and what we call core strength is critically important because it's it's uh, going to enable your whole body to, to position itself on top of your legs that are planted firmly on the ground. And certainly upper body strength is important as well. Uh, strength in your biceps, your triceps, and all of the large proximal muscles, the muscles that are that are attached to the shoulder blade and onto the thorax. You know, somebody wrote a song called uh, Hip Bones Connected to This Bone, and, and <laughs> it's true. Everything is connected. So strengthening, uh, full body strengthening is very important. So if somebody's looking to um, begin uh, this kind of an activity, what sort of a, a planning approach should they take toward you know, when it is that they start, I guess, almost conditioning themselves for it? Yeah. Um, you know, there's two, two, generally two categories of people that, that we talk about. First off are those people who are starting the sport and activity for the first time, and those pe- then those people who are returning to the sport because it's a seasonal sport, so you may not really be focusing on conditioning and strengthening um, and prep for this sport throughout the whole summer. But certainly a six- to eight-week period of time, I think, is a good amount of time. You don't want to start, you know, on uh, – on Monday for your, your, your next weekend's uh, ski trip. You, you need some plenty of time to really get yourself in, in condition that it would really be a meaningful uh, prep period, so six to eight weeks. All right, let's go back to the importance of using a helmet. You talked about that earlier. I didn't ask you something that I was thinking, and I imagine some of the people listening to us may also have been thinking. Realistically, how often do you think people actually who are participating in these kinds of sports actually are using helmets now? Uh, realistically, I think it's about maybe 50% of people are, are, are really using helmets the way they should. So every, every one out of two people that you see probably should be doing something differently than, than they are. What could we do to increase those numbers? Outside of having this discussion we're having today. Well, that was my first thing, but yeah. Uh, well, you know, as, as parents, we can help guide uh, our, our young folks into doing that. Public uh, um, service uh, information is very, very important, as you're doing on this show. But just realizing and understanding that the head is very, very important. You know, I, I remember seeing a quote um, one time uh, that, you know, if you, if you can walk away from a uh, uh, a head injury uh, and a skiing accident, you're very lucky. You owe part of that to luck and the other, the other half of it to your helmet. So it's very, very important. Really, people should really understand that protecting your head is very important. It's very much like when you're, when you're riding a bike. You need to wear a helmet and protect your head. You know, I, I'm going to ask this question just because I don't know. Um, have the helmets become more sophisticated? Are they, are they better than they used to be? Oh yeah, yeah. They they understand that you want to um, attenuate or soften the amount of stress that the the impact is giving sooner rather than later, and so they're really making them. Um, they have a harder shell, and they have much better shock absorption capability within the uh, the confines of the helmet. So they are much much better today than they were years ago. And when. Taking that approach toward um, getting a helmet, how important is it that somebody has one that's appropriate for them? Well, it's a, it's a, a great question. You, have, you asked the best questions. I'm well, I, I try to go on the basis of things that I'm thinking, and hopefully some of the people listening to us are. But thank you. Well, you know, let's, let's just take the guy who, who wants to get a good pair of uh, um, hockey skates. Mm-hmm. He's going to put them on. He's going to feel them. He says, you know, how are they constructed on the outside? And how, are they, how do they feel? Do they fit right? Do they move right? Is there too much, uh, too much slipping action going on inside? Am I, am I going to have good control over my feet and the skates? Are they, are they going to become one with me? So really the same approach that you should take with, uh, with a helmet. Certainly a good quality construction is important, but a good fit is very, very important. It has to have a good strap, and it has to have a good fit and contour on your head. They make different sizes, and like I said, they have a, a much better interior construction today that that helps to attenuate or soften um, all of the blow that that might go onto the head. So fit is, I think, uh, uh, paramount in, in addition to proper construction. 
Let's go to the other end of the body. Um, broken legs. How common is that with skiers? Uh, very common. Yeah, it used to be uh, that um, the the um, the injuries were largely ankle injuries, but they uh, they improved the, the ski boots. They uh, made them a little bit higher, and uh, as a consequence, uh, sometimes if bindings don't release the way they should, uh, yeah, mid-tibial fractures, the tibia is the, is the shin bone, uh, mid-tibial fractures occur um, quite often. But uh, they are, they are a, a little bit less, a little bit reduced today because of better safety relief bindings. One of the things I had read in preparation for our discussion today is the fact that 10% of all the injuries that there are on the slopes are the result of collisions with other people who are skiing? Yeah. Isn't that something? That's incredible. Yes. Uh, they, are, they are collisions with, with other skiers, and there's also collisions with, with, the, with the environment, trees. So, yeah, the, part of the thing is that, like, you know, again, I mentioned, it's a, it's a high-speed activity, going down and skiing and wishing along. And if your skill level is, is borderline and you're coming at somebody, you really need to be able to redirect yourself away from that person to avoid a collision. And uh, not everyone uh, has, that, has, has that level of skill. So, yeah, it's a, that's a, a significant number, um, in, you know, inter-skier uh, collisions. And it can be quite, quite dangerous. Dr. Attilio Pensavalli is talking with us on our program. He's the founder of OrthoBalance Physical Therapy, which is located in Great Neck. They're on the web at orthobalancept.com. And uh, we've been talking with him about uh, winter sports injuries. We began this uh, hour talking about uh, the proper way to approach uh, s snow. Of course, we've got the snow and day and uh, happening for a good deal of Monday uh, pretty much throughout the uh, listening area. It depends on exactly where you are in terms of exactly how much accumulation there will or will not be. Um, tell you what we'll do is I'd like to try to work some of our listeners into our discussion to uh, WFAN's toll-free line, 877-337-6666. It is brought to you by the Endless Summer Party at Resorts AC, managed by Mohegan Sun. And we'll see if we can uh, get some thoughts from some of those folks who are listening to us. A lot of times people in these discussions have mentioned some of the areas of injury that you have talked about. When we talk about the winter sports as well. What about this idea of um, things with people's uh, shoulders, uh, whether they're dislocations, fractures, how common are they? Well, they're pretty common. You know, uh, there were about, uh, about 15 or 20 shoulder injuries in the past Winter Olympics in Sochi. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are significant because you're using... You're using uh, ski poles. You're using your arms quite a bit. They are again high, high vigor, high stress activities. And even though you know these these elite athletes are very, very strong, very, very conditioned, the forces that that can occur uh, just in the normal uh, operation of these sports are, are tremendous. And then when something goes uh, goes amiss, when you're falling and and tumbling on the snow, uh, anything can happen. But so yes, uh, the shoulder injuries are quite common. Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point that I was thinking about heading into this discussion today is this whole idea of, you know, we saw the elite athletes with the Olympics. If injuries can happen with those folks, then obviously they can happen with those of us who are not elite athletes. Absolutely. So the idea is to be as prepared as possible when one is injured. How do we go about, I guess, for lack of a better term, managing injuries? Okay, well, that's a, that's a broad spectrum. You know, uh, first off, if you have a, an, an injury that doesn't require emergency medical care, certainly we look at the RICE principle. It's spelled R-I-C-E. That's rest, ice, compression, and elevation. You certainly want to rest the body part. Let's just say it's a knee. You want to rest it. You want to take it off, you know, take the weight off it. And then you want to try and, you know, reduce as much inflammation as, as possible. So you want to apply ice, which is a vasoconstrictor, reduces the amount of, of uh, inflammation that comes into the area. Uh, compression, you want to keep some pressure on it to reduce the amount of swelling that you have and elevate it. So for non-emergency injuries, certainly 
uh, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Certainly serious injuries need to be seen immediately, emergency department. And if something is persistent, then you want to consult with your physician or your doctor of physical therapy uh, to see uh, what the extent of the injury is and start on the healing process. And the idea or the approach of maintaining fitness, especially for those people who are involved, let's say, in, in skiing, um, how key is that, and how do you recommend they do that? Okay. Um, fitness is paramount because, again, these are high-stress activities. But if you look at um, elite athletes, if you look at a coach talking about uh, his team, and many times when they ask him, how are you going to do this season, coach? And they say, well, you know, if we, can, if we can stay healthy and stay out of injuries and keep our conditioning up, we'll do okay. And that's, that's the key. Conditioning is very, very important to maintaining strength and maintaining your endurance throughout a, uh, uh, an, an episode of, of uh, sports activity. So, you know, conditioning in terms of running or jogging, stationary cycling. Today, we have cross trainers in the gym. We have elliptical units, which are wonderful uh, pieces of equipment, uh, maintaining your strength with uh, progressive exercises, especially the lower extremities. Um, walking or running stairs is very, very helpful. Uh, doing half squats uh, are very, very helpful. Just sitting to a 90-degree 90, 90 position and standing, that's very, very helpful with or without weights. You can do an isometric exercise that we call a 90-90, which is just lean, you know, sitting against the wall uh, so that you're, you're leaning against the wall, you're holding yourself up with your legs, and you, it, it looks as if, almost as if you're sitting on a chair, but the wall is, is bracing you. So that's very, very important. If you're really looking to maintain a high level of conditioning, you may want to consult a physical therapist or a personal trainer so that they could help you um, address the areas that you may have missed on your own. All right. You know, one of the areas that you mentioned, in a way, I think is going to be addressed by uh, our first uh, caller. Our number here at the fan is 877-337-6666. And you can join our discussion. We're talking with Dr. Attilio Pensavalli. He's the founder of OrthoBalance Physical Therapy, which is located in uh, Great Neck. Let's um, go to the island. As a matter of fact, we'll go to Rob in uh, Lake Success, who is uh, joining us on our program this morning. Rob? Good morning, Doctor. First of all, we're kind of neighbors. I'm on the south end of Great Neck, so uh, I know you, I, you're on uh, North Forest Pass Northern in, the, in town. Is um, that where you're located? I'm right on Northern Boulevard, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, here, here's my question. I'm actually driving right now. I'm an, I'm an, I consider myself an elite Masters athlete. I've run a 230 marathon uh, in the past in my 20s, so I'm a Masters runner now. I'm running, going training to the Boston Marathon. I'm in the car driving to run a half marathon right now as a training run. My, my, my question is this, liquid intake on cold weather versus warm weather, uh, hypothermia type questions, you know, this is with, with dealing with 30s this morning after running a half marathon, you know, you, you, you've lost a lot of fluids. I've done the preparation, obviously. I'm in you know, two, six weeks out from the Boston Marathon, so this is more of a tempo run for me. My question is drinking early versus drinking late, uh, how important is early in a half marathon? I'm planning on doing this in about an hour and 35 minutes, so pretty quick for a message runner. Um, is it critical at that point? And, and for Boston, depending on coming out of a cold weather environment all winter, I've run Boston and it's been 80 degrees. Give me a little feedback on the running situation for cold weather running versus warm weather running. And thank you. You've been great stuff this morning, and I hope everybody's been listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to answer that question. Yeah, hydration is always important, period, whether it's a high, you know, high temperature activity or cold weather activity. So there's no question about that. Prehydration is, is really best. It's certainly easier to maintain your hydration level if you start off with a good hydration level rather than catching up. If you get dehydrated and you're trying to catch up, your, your body is not going to work as efficiently. So you definitely want to uh, stay hydrated well before uh, through through the activity, and there's very there's well certainly with with summertime sports when your temperature is up in uh, in the 80s and a high humidity level, so you're going to lose a lot more fluid uh, more quickly than in winter sports. But don't underestimate the uh, the body's ability to churn out uh, high temperatures and lose a lot of hydration even in winter sports. So sometimes uh, you'll notice that you come out drenched, even though you may feel well it's 25 degrees. I'm running over here. I shouldn't even be sweating because it's so cold. But you do lose a lot of fluid even in the winter sports. Prehydrate and definitely um, the, do it as well in the winter. 
This idea of getting out and uh, running. Obviously, you know, we've got very bad weather uh, approaching us. How tempted do you find, especially some of the people that you work with in your practice, are athletes today um, to at times try to race along, shall I say, for lack of a better term, when it is that they should head back out when the conditions really are not that great. You know, a lot of people want to be able to go out and, and, and train in the outdoors. Um, obviously, this winter, a lot of the time, that has not been possible. Well, you know, one of the things we, we mentioned early on is uh, if you're going out doing uh, snow removal, how should you prepare? You should wear gloves and good footwear. So running is uh, very, very much a footwear-dependent activity. Mm -hmm. And if you've got slushy, wet conditions, snowy conditions, the footwear that's necessary to go do a good run on dry pavement is really not that conducive to uh, negotiating uh, snow piles or wet, puddly, slushy areas because they're just not going to be that water repellent. So although they may feel comfortable on your feet when you're in, in good condition and, and a, a dry, dry pavement, uh, if you run into uh, environmental uh, snow and slush, that's going to be a problem for you, sure. Now, I want to go into an area where we haven't delved thus far in our discussion. Um, let me mention the fact that for anybody who's just joining us in our discussion, we're talking with Dr. Attilio Pensavalli. He's the founder of OrthoBalance Physical Therapy, which is located in uh, Great Neck on the island, um, orthobalancept.com, the website. You're very kind with your time. One of the areas that your firm works is something that intrigued me and um, I think will interest some of the people listening to us as well. And that is in this area of what would be referred to, I guess, as geriatric physical therapy. What exactly is involved in that? Well, geriatric physical therapy is caring for the different physical problems that an older population would tend to have. Um, one of the problems is uh, certainly balance and disequilibrium. Uh, many times as we, as we get older, our uh, peripheral senses are, are not as not as sharp as they once were, and we have different problems with with balance and so on. So that's one of the areas that we address uh, uh, somewhat in an expert uh, level. And the name is Ortho Balance Physical Therapy because many of balance problems resu you know result in orthopedic problems. So we deal with with both of those issues. Uh, an, an older population has uh, uh, a high level of osteoporosis. They have a general decline in muscular strength and as much of that is, is correctable or manageable uh, to a significant level. So that's what we deal with. And the, the, does that include people who, you know, have issues with falling um, and the like? Oh, yeah. Everybody is concerned about falling because, uh, you know, once you hit the ground, everything changes. Uh, there are injuries that are very, very significant. Hip injuries, you know, there are about 350,000 hip fractures annually because of, uh, because of falls. It's a very, very significant problem. And one of the statistics that we see is that, you know, unfortunately, uh, the mortality rate in the first year is about 20%. So you do the arithmetic. It's 350,000 really? times 20%. It's 70,000 uh, possible fatalities just from hip fractures alone. It's a very, very significant problem. And one of the other areas that always comes up in discussions like that is the whole um, idea of, I guess, walking uh, problems that sometimes people who are a little bit older, they will encounter. Those can be addressed? Yes, absolutely. Strengthening, conditioning uh, is something that the human body it needs to have throughout the continuum of, of life. And so, you know, many people think that if, as, if you're older, then, you know, strength and conditioning is not for you because it's, uh, it's a lost cause. Nothing could be further from the truth. An older population does respond very, very well and gain a lot of benefit from even a low level of exercise that really increases their capabilities. So, yes, uh, strength and conditioning is very appropriate for an older population. It really helps maintain safety. And does that at times very perhaps have maybe a residual benefit of areas involving, let's say, their mental health. Oh, absolutely. It increases your activity level. It increases your, your mobility. You can go out. You're healthier. You get back to dancing. And all of that stuff is just uh, in, adds to your quality of life. It makes people much, much happier and uh, much sharper as well. You have a lot of fun with what you do, don't you? I love it. I've been doing it for 32 years, and I wouldn't do anything else. 
Dr. Attilio Pensavalli, who is a physical therapy doctor. He's the founder of OrthoBalance Physical Therapy, located in Great Neck, orthobalancept.com, the website. Dr. Pensavalli, thank you very much for being so kind with your time and joining us on our program this morning. I know your words have um, been very informative for a lot of the folks uh, listening to us. A lot of the people will check out the uh, website as well. Thank well, you. Well, I appreciate it being on here, Bob. It's a great way to start a nice Sunday morning, and um, I wish you the best for today. Thank you. you.